Grace and peace be multiplied to all of you, my beloved. How are you doing today? Great to be with you once again. Uh, once again, um, and for clarity, Pastor Tim is okay. He's just enjoying and traveling, so there's no issues. But uh, you've been so kind and encouraging with your words, so let me know that uh, you've been enjoying um, what this humble servant has been doing with this material. So uh, you just get more of it today. So <laughs> it is my honor and pleasure once again to serve the Word of God and to handle it uh, straightly by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, with uh, no interest in wasting time, let's get right into it. And I'm, in fact, I'm not going to uh, do a recap of what we did last week, just to mention that last week we saw the full chapter one of Ruth, and today we're going to go straight into chapter two, which we've entitled uh, A Vulnerable Outsider as the title of this drama that is unfolding right in front of us in the book of Ruth. So in Act 2, we see that um, the act, we've titled it A Vulnerable Outsider, and Ruth is finding refuge under the kanaf of the Lord. We will define that in just a few moments. But let's read the passage, uh, at least the very first couple of verses, and then we can get right into it. So it says... Naomi, or now Naomi, had a relative of her husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, following one in whose eyes I may find favor. And she said to her, go my daughter. So it opens up very beautifully, but let's analyze it to make sure we don't miss out on any of the details that are here. So firstly, the narrator is providing a foreshadowing. Is uh, the coming of, of the coming act, the narrator wants the reader to know that there is some future character to keep in mind who is both wealthy and a relative. These are the two characteristics of this character that uh, the narrator is trying to highlight for us that he is wealthy, uh, he has uh, riches, earthly possessions, but he's also a relative, still undefined where that relationship is, but it springs to mind that this is a very special character in this narrative. As a man of wealth and as a relative, this new character brings in a host of possibilities, but at this point we do not know how close a relative he is. Uh, if he were the nearest brother of Elimelech, he would be obligated by Deuteronomy 25 to marry Naomi in order to preserve Elimelech's line by having a son with her. And uh, for those who, of you who weren't here, or just as a refresher, obviously Elimelech was the, uh, the husband of Naomi who passed away in chapter 1. So this is why if this new character was a close relative, he would have to enjoin with the widow in order to preserve uh, Elimelech's line that was obligated by law. Uh, if he were the nearest relative because of Leviticus 25, verses 25 to 28, he would be awarded the opportunity to redeem Elimelech's property and return it to Naomi, if she was still alive, or her descendants. None of those existed, of course. She would, she... Uh, encountered this widow status without uh, having the opportunity. Uh, well, she did have the opportunity to bear children, but they have, had uh, passed away as well. So there were no errors uh, of their property. Um, on the year of Jubilee, right? So however, the particular circumstances of Naomi and Ruth appear that neither of these laws necessarily apply. So although the text doesn't describe Oh, uh, this doesn't dis apply, this doesn't apply. The first readers of this book would have known the law sufficiently enough to uh, realize that the fact that these possibilities did not take place means that uh, the, the circumstances that would be conditions for these laws uh, were not present at this moment. Okay? So in verse 2, we see that Ruth takes the initiative from Naomi and presents the idea of gleaning. Right Now, gleaning may have several meanings in the uh, ancient times. Meaning could have, uh, gleaning could have been um, uh, picking up from the ground, or it could have been picking up from the, the uh, stalks of grain 
uh, anything that was left over. So either one would apply in this instance. The narrator keeps Ruth's ethnic identity before the reader's eyes because the narrator calls her not by her name, but in the first instance in this chapter calls her the Moabitess. So as if to remind us that she is an outsider. She is an immigrant. She does not belong to them. And this is why the narrator says the Moabitess in this chapter. Gleaning, once again, is not harvesting. Gleaning is scavenging. So gleaning is not just picking up the grain that is you know, growing on the crops. No, gleaning is taking of what is left over. Right? Leviticus 19 uh, verses 9 to 10 requires landowners to allow the poor and the foreigners in the land to pick up the grain left over from the first run through of collecting the grain. This was Israelite law to uh, make a provision for outsiders to pick up the grain. Now, um, it, it really doesn't make sense that they would hold on to the grain because they had already collected of the crops. But um, if that law were not in place, they could have said, you know, get off my land, you're not welcome here. But the law actually provided uh, an escape of, or, or a, pr a provision of mercy for the poor and for the foreigner to be able to collect this grain and then sustain themselves and their families. Then it says, in whose eyes I may find favor. So the word favor here is the Hebrew chen, or grace. It's another way to say grace. This word comes from a root meaning to incline towards, to bend towards, uh, such as when you bend down to a child to give that child something. This word informs the entire act to follow. So in other words, just this word being there, that there is some inclination, it kind of like precedes what is about to happen. There's going to be an act of grace uh, such as would be surprising to the reader. So continuing our reading of the text from verse 3 forward, it says, So she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant in charge of the reapers replied, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has remained from the morning until now, she has been sitting in the house for a little while. So, in verse 3, we see that Ruth happened, or by chance, came to Boaz's field. Now, this is the, uh, the way uh, the author is using to kind of wink at the audience uh, by using what is called an antiphrasis or antiphrasis. It's a phrase that means it's opposite. Uh, in English, we do this when something bad happens and we respond, Hi, uh, how are you doing? Oh, great. You know, <laughs> have you ever seen somebody that says, how are you feeling? Ah, uh, I'm fine. And you sense in their voice that they're actually saying the opposite. It's kind of the same thing. You know, it's like, oh, she happened to pass through Boaz's field. It's like in, uh, in Spanish, we have a phrase, diocidencia. It's almost like a, instead of a coincidence, it's a God incidence, right? <laughs> it's something moved by the hand of God and it just happened, but you know who's behind the whole act. Right. So the intended meaning is that this was anything but chance, anything but chance. In verse 4, we see that Boaz's first action in the narrative is to bless his workers and receive a blessing in return from them. Uh, the idea is that unlike everything we've ever learned up to this point about Bethlehemites from the previous two Bethlehem stories, Boaz is a faithful follower of Yahweh by the, the way he's treating his workers, by the way he's blessing them upon his salutation, we see that it's, he's a man of God. Now, the, the workers uh, respond in kind, but, you know, it's left to find out whether they're just doing it because that's what they're supposed to do or they're actually doing it from the heart. The text doesn't say, but the text allows for those possibilities. 
In verse 5, Boaz asks the chief servant who is responsible for Ruth to discern her identity. Who is this woman? Uh, he may have interrupted a scene of discomfort based on the servant's awkward reply. And this is, by the awkward reply, we see this in verses uh, 6 and 7. The servant rambles and stumbles his answer. Uh, in the Hebrew, the answer is so weird and so disjointed uh, that much of, much of work has been done to make it coherent in translation. In English, if we were to translate it word by word, it would sound something like this. Um, it's the Moabite young woman returning with Naomi from Moab. And then, uh, please glean, allow me, she said, among the sheaves, and has been here from morning until now, except the house a little. It's like rambling, right? It's almost like the talk of somebody that is not, is not confident. The person is nervous. Uh, the servant is stammering and stuttering. Uh, but also pay attention to this fact, is that the servant is trying to paint Ruth in a bad light. He is saying that she wanted to get grain from the collected sheaves instead of from the harvested field, and stating her Moabite origins twice, so as if to remind Boaz, you know, this is a foreigner, and, you know, then the foreigner said, and he's like emphasizing the fact that she doesn't belong. Were the servants harassing her when Boaz showed up? Did they take her into the house to ridicule or abuse her? Uh, it reminds me that we can tell the truth, but kind of with the wrong heart, and then make somebody else, you know, uh, be seen in a bad light. It sounds like this is what they're trying to do. Like, she's not welcome. This is what they're doing. She's re they're reporting on what she's doing, but they're saying it in a way with just a sprinkle of lies and exaggeration. Right. Um, Kay Lawson Younger, in the uh, commentary, the NIV application commentary about Ruth, says the following. Rather pejoratively, the overseer states, she is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. The double repetition of her origin, the Moabitess who came back from Moab, um, and the fronting of the ethnic form, the first word, to emphasize the overseer's attitude toward Ruth. Furthermore, he insinuates that uh, to Boaz, the field's owner, that this Moabitess is not like the other poor gleaners. She's different because she's gathering too much grain. He claims, she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. By adding the, the verb gather to the verb glean, as well as by changing the place of her work, he strongly intimates that she is getting too much. The fact is one cannot collect too much grain when gathering among the stalks. On the other hand, if gathering among the sheaves in other words, the bundles of grain ready for, ready for transport, the gatherer can take whole sheaves, or at least parts of sheaves, which consist of many stalks of grain. These subtle differences in wording present Ruth in a less than favorable light. So once again, she is in a foreign land, and the people who are working in the land are not doing her any service. They are trying to paint her like she's doing the wrong thing. She's taking from where she's not supposed to be taking. So she's already uh, not on the upper hand of this situation. She's uh, behind um, in terms of advantage, in terms of favor. But then we see what occurs uh, afterwards. In verse 8, then Boaz said to Ruth, listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one. But join my young women here. Keep your eyes on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have ordered the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Boaz replied to her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me, and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work, and may your wages be full from the Lord, 
the God of Israel, under whose kanaf you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me, and indeed have spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not like one of your female servants. Okay? So in verse 8, Boaz does not dignify the servant with a reply. He doesn't even answer or get into a whole mess of his version. He immediately addresses Ruth. He raises her status to the young women working in the household and asks her to remain in Boaz's estate for gleaning. In verse 9, Boaz assures her that on his orders, she will not be harassed and she may drink water made available to his official workers. So he's already showing her provision. She's already show, he's already showing her uh, favor in saying, you, not, you may not only glean from my field, but you can drink from, from the water. You can take of the provisions for my worker as if you were one of them as well. And then verse 10, we see that Ruth falls before Boaz and touches her forehead to the earth and asks, why he is showing such kin to a foreigner as herself. When I read this uh, recently, it reminded me of that psalm. You don't have it in your notes, but that psalm that says, I think it's psalm, well, I'm not even going to try to guess. You, you Google it. Uh, the psalm that says, what is man that you may have memory of him, right? It's almost the same heart in, in, Ruth's, in Ruth's words, in her lips. What am I that you would take notice of a simple immigrant, of a simple foreigner. Uh, and and the text uses the word ken, once again, that word for uh, bending over, grace. Verses 11 and 12, Boaz acknowledges Ruth's hesed toward Naomi. Remember that word hesed, which means that love, that loyalty all bound together. Uh, but, but Boaz is acknowledging Ruth's hesed toward Naomi and her allegiance to Yahweh under whose kanaf, uh, which could mean wings, robe, skirt, she has found refuge. So first I want to highlight the fact that Boaz seemed to have heard of what Ruth did for Naomi, what, how sh she showed up for her mother-in-law to be, to pledge loyalty with her, uh, to her, and follow her. So Boaz is recognizing that and responding in kind to what he had heard her reputation was at that point. Uh, and then it says uh, her kanaf. Now kanaf um, is, a, is a word in Hebrew that once again expresses the wings or the robes, um, the, the priestly robes it could be. We see that idea of kanaf. You don't have this in your notes, but you may want to take note of these passages. In Exodus 19.4, uh, God um, speaks and says to Israel, you know, how I have carried you on the wings of eagle. You remember that? Um, also in Psalm 57, it says, under the shadow of your wings, I will be refuged, right? That's Psalm, five, uh, Psalm 57, and I think it's in the first couple of verses. Uh, and then remember in Matthew 23, when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the uh, uh, the, the uh, teachers of the law, he was saying, oh, Israel, Israel, how I long to gather you un under my wings like a hen gathers her chick, but you didn't wa did, not, did not want, right? So it's this idea of protection, of gathering, but it's expressed both in the visuals of the hen with her wings, but also in the robes of a teacher or a priest that is interceding for uh, someone else, but certainly it speaks about God having those wings and covering us under the shadow of his refuge. And this is what um, Naomi, um, or Boaz, is highlighting that um, Ruth did toward Naomi. Um, uh, allegiance not only to Naomi, but allegiance to Yahweh under whose kanaf she has found refuge. So Boaz, by showing Ruth grace, he's acting as that covering robe of Yahweh for her. And her reward is not from Boaz. Boaz is simply a channel of God's favor upon Ruth. Isn't that amazing? That Boaz is just a minister for God in this act 
of extending grace toward this strange foreigner uh, woman and widow. So verse 13, Ruth sums up the interaction by receiving his chen, or his favor, his nehum, his comfort, and his kind words, even though she's an ethnic outsider and undeserving in the social status in which she found herself in this land. All right, so going into the next act where Ruth eats her fill and fills Naomi, uh, let's read from verses 14 to 16. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here, that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he served her roasted grain. And she ate and was satisfied and had some left. When she got up to glean, Boaz commanded his servant, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. As you are to purposely slip out for her some grain for the, from the bundles and leave it so that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So right there in verse 14, we see that Boaz invites the Moabite scavenger to join him and his workers in a meal. So the grace just keeps adding on and adding on, offering the best that he has. Not only did she eat to the full, but had some left over. It was unthinkable to set a place at the meal for a foreign widow scavenger, and yet this was how Boaz showed Ken, right? He's saying, come sit with us. Come sit by my side. You're, you're, you can participate in uh, what we are doing and what we're celebrating, what we're sharing here. So in verses 15 and 16, the chief servant, perhaps falsely, had accused Ruth of wanting to glean in the already collected bundles, right? But now Boaz instructs his servants to allow Ruth to do exactly that. Isn't that amazing? Amazing turn of events where the servant is saying, oh, she's taking from the, the collected bundles of wheat where she did not do that. But now that Boaz has shown favor to her, he says, let her do exactly that. Exactly what she did not do and she's innocent of doing, let her do that so she can collect. But furthermore, he commands them to throw some harvested grain purposely on the ground for her to collect uh, so that she can collect even more than what, is, what she's supposed to. That's overflowing grace. It's a great picture. This is extravagant. It's extreme and almost outrageous ken that, she's, that he is uh, showing toward her. So Daniel Block, whom we have read in other sessions, says the following. Obviously, this verse, verse uh, chapter 2, verse 13, uh, 14, is not simply about feeding the hungry. The narrator hereby shows how Boaz took an ordinary occasion and transformed it into a glorious demonstration of compassion, generosity, and acceptance. In short, the biblical understanding of hesed. The text offers no hint of any romantic attraction yet between Boaz and Ruth. Given the racial and social barriers that separated them, the thought would not have even crossed Ruth's mind. And she could not have known that he was a kinsman of her deceased husband. As for Boaz, he was simply a good man, sent by God to show favor to this woman. The wings of God are not only comforting to Israelites, they offer protection even for the despised Moabites. Wow, that is amazing. What a, an amazing picture that we can uh, glean from, no pun intended. We can extract from that um, and learn from, from that on the heart of God through Boaz. So verses 17 forward uh, says, So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. And she picked it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also took some out and gave Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today, and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord 
who has not withdrawn his hesed from the living and from the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, furthermore, he said to me, you are to stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with this, with this young woman so that others do not assault you in another field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. So in verse 17, we see an ephah of barley. Uh, it, it is not clear how much exactly, as in many of the measurements in the Bible, how much exactly that the equivalent of our modern times would be. But according to some commentators that I was able to dig up, it was about between four and six gallons of wheat, right? Uh, it was enough grain for two people to eat for 10 days. So the barley harvest would include about 42 working days. If Ruth, Ruth brought home a similar amount each working day, each time she went to the field and came back, she brought a similar amount, she would have enough food for both Naomi and herself for over a year. So, wow, she was just, you know, storing up. God was providing much more abundantly uh, than they even expected when they were returning to those lands. The scale of this generosity is certainly overwhelming, overwhelming. It's not typical. It's extravagant. This is what the narrator wants us to understand. This is not, she didn't deserve it. It wasn't uh, owed to her in any way. This was above and beyond they were even expecting. In verse 18, we see that Ruth returns to Bethlehem and shows Naomi the abundance and gives the leftover roasted grain from, back from the lunch with Boaz to her for a meal right there, fast food. You know, she's bringing back the roasted grain for, for her to, to, uh, to taste right then and there. Naomi, who claimed the Lord left her empty, is now being filled. Back in chapter 1, she said, I'm empty. I have nothing. But now the Lord is extending favor upon her. It's a mere down payment on the filling that is about to come in latter passages in this book. Verses 19 to 20, when Naomi learns that the generous man was Boaz, she offers a prayer for him and acknowledges the chesed of Yahweh, not because of the food, but because Boaz is a potential goed or redeemer. Goed is the Hebrew term for kinsman redeemer, for the person that liberates a family that is stricken in poverty or under a heavy burden of debt. And this is the person that comes and rescues them so that they do not remain as slaves. So um, Naomi recognizes that he has the potential to be a potential kinsman redeemer. Since the exact circumstances don't obligate Boaz to marry Naomi or buy the property, it is unclear still why Naomi is so excited. It may be that she has already begun to formulate a plan to leverage Boaz's kens to her advantage. And we're not insinuating here that it's, an, it's a malignant, it's an evil advantage. It is to continue receiving the favor that she has been receiving up to now, that she has seen that demonstration uh, uh, firsthand up to this point. Verses 21 to 23, this is where we learn that Naomi can expect similar amounts of grain throughout the whole harvest period, providing food security for the entire year. Naomi then introduces the element of Ruth's preservation from sexual assault by telling her to stick with Boaz. So right in between the lines of our narration, we get the sense that these are danger dangerous times and dangerous lands, particularly for a widowed, young, probably beautiful woman to be in the field alone with nobody to look over her, to nobody, for nobody to respond for her. And we remember back in the same chapter when Boaz asks, uh, who does this young woman belong to, right? Not as in, implying that she's less than human, but this is the ancient world, is that a young woman, uh, uh, somebody responded for her, whether it was her father, her husband, 
her brothers. Somebody responded and was uh, res responded not just in terms of provision, but also for protection for this young woman. But given the fact that she does not have anybody responding for her, uh, these are dangerous times. And you can sense a little bit of the concern in Naomi's words uh, when she says, stick to this land. You are secure. You are safe. You're, you're not to, do anywhere, to go anywhere else because the Lord is protecting you. You're seeking somebody that has already uh, vowed to look over you. Uh, Ruth continues to glean for about seven weeks, and by settling in with Naomi, Ruth continues to fulfill her promise to stay with her. So we see that this is a significant passage of time throughout the harvest, and the text lets us understand that the circumstances that we've understood at the, up to this point will continue throughout uh, this period. So that leads us to ask, what would the first audience think? I'm reading Act 2, uh, chapter 2 of Ruth for the very first time, what would they have thought? Well, first, Boaz would have been seen as someone who exemplified Torah adherence and observance, and tzaddik, which is the Hebrew term for righteousness or doing right by God and others, by his greeting to the workers. This would be a very noble thing to do. He wasn't an, uh, an abusive or authoritarian person. He blessed them uh, with the same blessing that any of us would expect. Boaz observes the Torah, but in a strange way. Instead of sticking only to the letter of the gleaning law in Leviticus 19. In other words, he did not uh, owe Ruth anything beyond the letter of the law. But he goes far beyond it in compassionate grace. Uh, then Abraham and Isaac would have been remembered because uh, they were promised that their descendants would be a blessing to the nations. Uh, we can see this in Genesis 12.2, Genesis 22.18, and Genesis 26.4. And by all means, please look up those passages when you get a chance. Um, it's easy to kind of brush over that and think that God's blessing was over the nations or the tribes of Israel, but no. The blessing to the nations uh, was specifically God extending prophetically His blessing to the non-Israelites, to everyone beyond the Israelites. So this would have been apparent in Boaz's treatment to Ruth. Uh, she was not yet under the covenant law of Israel, but uh, in, in any case, Boaz was applying the heart of the law. He models the ultimate purpose of Israel by blessing the marginalized Moabite. And then the original audience at the end of, act, of the act, uh, seven weeks passed without any further interaction with Ruth and Boaz described in the narrative. So it's a cliffhanger of, of sorts. What will happen? What is Naomi thinking? What is she planning? This is a, a great sense of buildup and curiosity for what is to come in the narrative. So what is left for us, the modern day readers? What should we reflect on Act 2 today? Well, the author of Ruth is beginning to invite us to meditate on what fulfilling the law actually means. Does it mean simply checking off the boxes, doing what, what I'm told to, and following the letter of the law? Or are we supposed to look at God's commands through the lens of God's character, seeing the heart of the law rather than just living by the letter of the law? It invites us to reflect. It invites us to reflect. Are we inclined to show hesed, steadfast kindness, and hen, grace and favor, to those who can return the favor? Pay us back, elevate our status, pat us in the back, give us reputation, give us material advantage in this world? Or are we inclined to show those things to the outsider, the marginalized, the one who cannot return the favor, who is not in the position to be kind toward us? Which of the two would be what you would think God wants us to do? So Jesus clearly was keyed into the theme of this act in the book of Ruth and used its lessons to inform his ministry. To Jesus, whatever chesed we show to the least of these, we show to God. It's inviting us to go deeper into not just 
following the letter of the law, being religious, doing what we're told, but actually putting our ears to the heart of God and asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to go beyond? Do you want me to go over and abundantly what I'm called to do? Because God has been as abundant to us. Amen. So with that, let's go to our workshop. Let's give a hand to our students at the table so they may be encouraged to share their thoughts. <laughs> and I am always exciting to, excited to hear uh, what everyone here has to say. God bless you, my brother. <laughs> and now you're good. So who wants to go first? <laughs> thoughts, questions, whatever. I'm just curious, you know, we... They talk about before how Moabitus was not a good person, according to Israelite. Yeah. What what kind of static would Boaz get? I mean, he was a prominent guy. Yes. And he was doing these things. I mean, that's got to weigh on his friends and, and things around him. How how would that affect his his being? That is a question. That yeah, that's a question. I mean, certainly the text does not describe that. But we see that in other places in the Bible. I just think about Jesus, how Jesus extended and had suppers with uh, sinners, with co uh, collectors of, you know, tax collectors, and had uh, share with people that were undesirable. And what response did Jesus get? It was, yeah, they, they ended up crucifying him in the end. But even in the act, it was like, well, what are you doing sitting down with sinners, you know? There's always like that blowback to your reputation when you do that. So there's a cost to pay. Um, looking back at Jesus' genealogy, we find that Rahab was Boaz's mother. Mm. That's what it looks it's like a, to me a, a when I'm yeah. looking at that. And she was a Gentile. She was, Rahab was. Mm -hmm. So then this shows us that this is at the beginning of the judges. This yes. Time. Mm -hmm. But so when he's thinking, well, my mother was a Gentile proselyte. Right? Yeah, yeah. And now maybe that's part of what he's thinking yeah, about, like you know, so he doesn't have that discrimination like maybe some of the Jewish people had. Yeah, there's a good point. There's a good point. A lot of, oftentimes our past experience, our family, informs the way we live. And, uh, and then when you're instructed by the word, it kind of matches up. You understand the why. Oh, this is why God had favor on my, my, uh, my, you know, my, my family, my past family, even though they sh for their lifestyle they didn't deserve it. This is the why. So it's a great point. Love it. Very good. Anyone else? This table is very meditative today. <laughs> very silent. <laughs> couple thoughts that go through my mind and this is the, the story of Boaz and Ruth is a, a picture of redemption mm. um, in a lot of ways just you know kind of pointing out Boaz's history and then the name the meaning of Boaz um, I first got introduced to that name when I was reading about Solomon and the pillars that he named mm. uh, Boaz and, and Jaquin I just love that name and so the name means if I remember correctly, it is strength or, or strength. Mm -hmm. And then the role that he plays is like a type and shadow of Christ yeah. in a lot of ways. It is. Uh, and how he is helping Ruth or redeeming her when she's looked down upon. And then just the understanding of the history of Moab in general, that city, um, it was named after the, the, the son of uh, Lot's daughter, yeah, his so. oldest daughter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So an incestual relationship mm. between Lot and his oldest daughter is really what founded Moab. So you can see the, the spiritual, were, yeah. you know, just decay of that city. Mm -hmm. And from that, you've got the Moabites who then, you know, you can see why the Israelites look down on them yes. so much just from the history of how that came from. And then to see Boaz's um, you know, his favor towards her yes. being a woman and the cultural ramifications there, yes. being a foreigner, and then the history of Moab, and like she's, she's got, like it's a double whammy, and then Boaz is 
you know, doing everything that he's doing, almost in abundance, like you said, mm -hmm. just more than normal. More than was required. It just reminds me of, you know, God's provision yes. is not based out of scarcity, but it's in abundance. It's Amen. always more than what you would need. And so this is just a picture in these two individuals, which eventually get married. And now you, you've got, he's a type of Christ and she's the bride that's just <laughs> of the church yeah, yeah. it is a picture see that in these two yes in that story great point absolutely absolutely yeah and um and you touched on something which is the the fact that you know she's a moabite and we you know the past couple of weeks we uh delved on that but the amount of stereotypes that would be just feel the fact of where she was born where her family was oh she's from that land of bad people she must be a bad person you know and it's, it's the heart of flesh and the heart that is, you know, a lot of us deal with that, no matter where we are or who we have, you know, where we come from. And, you know, um, we deal with that stereotypical branding from people. And, and as you very well pointed out, Boaz rose above. He's seeing her in the spirit, not by the flesh. Very cool. When you think about Ruth being a picture of the church and, and, and how Christ um, desires her to be without spot or wrinkle and, mm. and he, he purifies her yes. right, by the redemption. And then you look at everything that he just, you know, what he just said about, about Ruth and, and her roots, right? And you think about what the Bible says about sin, iniquity, and transgression, right? Yes. You know, so your natural tendencies to sin might be different than your natural tendency to sin. Mm -hmm. And all of that being in your lineage and potentially um, curses through your lineage mm. and how none of it's difficult for God. Yes, it's yes. It's just nothing. Yes. And, you know, it, it's grace upon grace, right? So mm. Boaz doesn't even see it. Yeah. He just sees, you know, Ruth. Exactly. As she was created to be, I mean, maybe Boaz doesn't have the time, but Christ looks at us as how he created us to be. Yes. Instead of all the things that we maybe didn't have any control over. Yeah. You know, maybe we were abused and we have that in our lineage. Maybe, you know, mm -hmm. there was alcoholism in our lineage. And, you know, there's all these things that we didn't ask for. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he just, it's just gone. It's just yes. broken. Those curses are just over. Yes. That's so good. That's so good. You just reminded me of, well, I mean, we just finished the book of uh, Ephesians where the Bible instructs husbands to treat their wives as washed by the water and, you know, cleansed. And, you know, when Boaz is presenting Ruth as dignified, you know, you're, you're, you belong. You're dignified. I'm not going to treat you as, you know, according to these stereotypes. You're, you can sit at the table right with us, you know. Oh, please do in the microphone. <laughs> he calls her something that she isn't. He, he calls her that. Yes. So he calls her something she isn't yet. That is amazing. That's awesome. I love your comments. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I mean, I don't, this isn't like brilliant or anything. But <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I just read the story a lot of times, and I never saw or understood that the servant that was explaining to Boaz about Ruth, that he was really taking a dig at her or trying to make her look worse mm. in that person's eye, in his eyes. Yes. And I'm like, golly, yeah. it's just, it, I'm mad. Yeah. Right <laughs> um, it bothers me. I'm like, this poor woman, she's got all this stuff against her yes. already. Yes. And for him to do that, I'm no. But it's just, then you see the love and the mercy mm. of God and that Boaz, he, he was a faithful follower of Yahweh, which I, I knew that, but it's just yeah. cool to see that his love, his kindness and mercy toward her, uh, you know, gave her protection and elevation and, yes. and provision. So I love that, that God provided for her, even though all, all those things were against her. Yeah. Yeah, and don't feel wrong, uh, don't feel bad about not seeing that before because you really need to have a grasp of the original language or some commentators to really understand, you know, how the servant was trying to do that. It's not as obvious in the English version, 
but you, if you read it again and maybe read several versions of the Bible with a fine-tooth comb, you can sense, like, why is he bringing up the Moabites? Like, Moabite from Moabite, Moab, you know, so many times and just kind of, like, bringing that up so that, you know, almost trying to influence Boaz into, eh, just kick her out, you know. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great contrast, though, you know, with how Boaz proceeded. Excellent. Any other thoughts? You have to give more thoughts because then, if not, then we have more time for questions. And then I'm, no, I'm just kidding. I am kidding. I'm kidding. I'm so sorry. I, I was just going to say, I really like what you said about reminding us who Boaz's mom is, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about what he rose to and why he has that strength is probably because of everything he probably went through the same as, yes. as Ruth is, right? I'm sure he was ridiculed. You know, you're the prostitute's son. Who huh. knows who your daddy is? I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. And then somehow God made a way for him to be this landowner of, of, of wealth. So yes. he was probably generous because God doesn't give somebody money. He doesn't keep giving it. Right? Yes. It has to be a blessing. So, right? Yeah. He didn't care. It didn't, mean, it didn't matter anything no. to him. That's a really good point. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. But, but the, Please in the microphone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The other thing that you brought up then was just the common folk. Oh no, hmm. because that that the head of his people gleaning, he was the guy like, oh, I, we don't want her in here. What, what yeah. is she doing here? And he was he was digging on her the whole time. Yes. So that would be, you know, the, the common people would would feel that way about. about yes, you know, mm -hmm. that's true. Now the educated, you know, and maybe a little different for them, but yeah. but, the, but the lesser folks are going to be against her. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's, it's like where he says, uh, what God says in, I, I don't know what book it is, but he hates the, uh, the haughty eye. Yes. Right, yeah. where you look down on someone. It's all over the Bible. It's all over in several says, books. I'm thinking like Proverbs, Psalms, yeah. somewhere, but you know, God says he, sees he, the haughty. he hates the haughty eye. Yeah. You look down on anyone. Yeah, he sees the haughty from a distance. So with three individuals, you have a, t a, a type and shadow of Christ, you have a, a woman that represents the bride of Christ and the servant who epitomizes the accuser, the which accuser. is what the enemy does to the bride of Christ, mm -hmm. in front of Christ, oh, to tie to his credit. The father of lies, right? Father of lies. Yeah. So that servant represents the enemy in that, in that little triangle, Good. which is just what the enemy does with all of us in the eyes of, of the father. Right. Yeah. And he ignores it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> because we're cut. Amen. You, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. I think um, what's interesting about what you said is I was thinking about it while you were saying it too. Um, it actually brings out another point about this book that's different than most of the narratives in the Bible because usually when you see that triune relationship, mm -hmm. the the deceiver, the deceived, and, and then the one who is at fault, um, usually it ends poorly, right? Mm. But here in this book, we see that there is a very different relationship between uh, Boaz, the one who was receiving the deceit, and mm. the one who was the culprit. Yeah. And that's because um, of two things. Um, one, because of the posture of Boaz's heart, but also because of the posture of Ruth's heart. Mm. Because even though she was, technically speaking, the guy wasn't was half wrong, yeah. right? Um, Ruth responded in a way that was grateful mm. and gracious to Boaz. Yes. And so I think looking at it like how Christ loves the church, it's written as well that a lot of times when we come to Christ with a posture of our heart that's gracious and willing and ready to serve and mm. just ready to lay everything down. He will, with no doubt, respond to us. Yes. And so I think, I think in that very small little act that goes on between that very, like, half a second thing that happens is a foretelling of why this story stands out among mm. the other ones and also the foreshadowing of what Christ is going to do for the bride, which is his church. That's awesome. Love that. Let's give a hand to our students at the table. This is amazing. You guys exceeded my expectations. This is awesome. So let's go to our favorite time, the questions from you. I very much look forward to hearing your questions. So do we have any questions today? Apparently we, we do. do. Yeah. 
Um, so our first question, um, so if the story is an example of Jews accepting Gentiles, why was there so much resistance by the Pharisees to follow this example after this story was in their Bible? That's, a, that's you see, that's a, that's a question that for us Christians that are redeemed, we have the Holy Spirit in us, we always look at the Pharisees and it's like, why, why didn't you get it? You know, why, you know they, it, was, it was right there. But remember that it was prophesied that they would have ears that wouldn't hear, eyes that wouldn't see. So they had a very hardened heart that they couldn't even read their own text and uh, see that heart, the spirit of, of the law. Not everybody, obviously. We know that not everybody um, had that. But this is what angered Jesus in his time was like, you know, how can you not see? I'm right in front of you. I'm telling words of life. So yeah, it's, it's one of those things. And um, without, you know, on the other side, without trying to be overly righteous or self-righteous or judgmental, we have to guard our hearts that we don't have that attitude too. That we don't have that attitude of not, you know, brushing by something that God is telling us and repeating us and we're actually paying attention to, to the Lord. So it's a lesson for us as well. Okay, so our next question. Um, with Ruth leading so much green, was it to eat or was it to sell and earn money for her and Naomi? Um, the implication that is for, to store and to eat. There is no implication in the text uh, that they had any, um, any representation in the market or were trying to do that. So we can't really infer that. It was simply overabundantly for them to store and to eat and maybe even to share it with others, but um, there, there is no implication that they were, you know, they, had, they were in a commercially viable position. Okay, so what is the meaning or significance of Ruth touching her forehead to the earth? Humility. It's humility, um, recognition that she's receiving grace that she did not deserve. And uh, um, it's not, by any means, it's not worship. It's not that. Um, it's just that she's incredibly humbled. And we see that in many parts of, of the Bible when somebody does good, you know, we see people just bowing down and um, saying, you know, thank you, thank you for your grace. Now, obviously, um, it's not in worship. There's no sense that it's worshipful or anything like that. Uh, it doesn't sound like that would be her heart. But, you know, to go beyond, obviously, the Bible commands us not to worship you know, people or angels or anything like that. The worship belongs to him. But this was not an attitude of worship. It was just humility and over-exceeding uh, gratefulness. Okay, so this is going to be our last question. Um, Boaz is a reflection of God's character towards humanity. How can we as the body of Christ implement this more in our lives to minister to the lost, hurt, and those who suffer in silence? That is a big question that I don't have I don't have time in five minutes to explain but that's the heart of the gospel it is the heart of the gospel it's recognizing what God has actually done for us that he did not treat us according to our works he did not treat us according to our merit uh, what we deserved we didn't deserve anything in the sight of God and yet right in our state God extended his hand and reached us and rescued us and made us sit in the heavenly places, right? So that we may have the privilege and the honor to enter into the throne room of God to receive grace, to receive mercy. Um, now, if we have been recipients of that grace, what is there to do? What is there to do other than to extend that grace to others? Not because of religiousness, not because of advantage of what we're gonna get in return, but because God deserves it. He deserves the honor and the praise. He deserves that we live lives that reflect his glory, his power, his mercy, the one who rescued us, that we may extend it to others. That's the heart of the gospel. That's, uh, you know, the whole gospel in a few words that I'm not doing enough justice to, but that's a great question, and I hope whoever asked that question, that the Holy Spirit worked in your heart so that um, you move uh, toward seeking and uh, extending your hand of mercy and grace to those who need it the most. So, yep, that is the 
great question and a great way to end at this point. So thank you very much for uh, your attention, for uh, this time with you. I've certainly enjoyed it, and I will see you next time. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Alex. Oh, um, I just want to pray before uh, we dismiss. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And um, God, I just don't think it's an accident that we're studying this uh, particular story right now. Father, we know that um, we live in a really broken world and that your loving kindness is so needed. We need it and we need to extend it. So I pray, Father, that you would empower and convict us, the church, the whole church everywhere around the world, to live in loving kindness and grace and humility, and that just as this precious woman, Ruth, her life was changed, her uh, lineage changed, and um, it affects us today, that we would bring about that kind of change by our behavior and by responding in the way that you have called us to, Lord. We just thank you for your mercy and your kindness to us, and I pray that is what we would reflect to the world, because we surely do not deserve it. And we just pray your blessing on Pastor Alex for filling in and being here with us. Thank you for your mercy and kindness to us, God. And um, we just ask your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. You are welcome to stay, men and women, women here, men in the um, uh, chapel. And I think that's it. Yes, thank you. See you next week. Pastor Tim will be back. <laughs>